George McJunkin was born into slavery on John Sanders McJunkin's ranch in Rogers Prairie, Texas, a decade before the Civil War commenced. His father, who had bought his freedom earlier, worked as a blacksmith and bred mules for the freighters transporting buffalo hide from the Indian territories to the east. While the war raged on and most white cowboys were off to battle, George honed his riding skills under the tutelage of the Mexican vaqueros who remained. When the war concluded, Texas was teeming with cattle. The population had swelled to nearly five million head while the men were away at war. Cowboys gathered the cattle and drove them north to the railheads for shipment to big cities in the east, where they were slaughtered for meat. At night, George would quietly slip away to the river to listen to the tales shared by the cowboys gathered around the fire as they herded the Longhorns north to Abilene, Kansas. George envisioned the freedom of life as a cowboy and was struck by the camaraderie and equality among black, white, and Mexican cowboys. During the night, George would sneak off to the river to hear the stories told by the cowboys gathered around the fire as they herded the Longhorns north to Abilene, Kansas. Barefooted, he set off down the dirt road. At daybreak, he stopped at the first house he came across and asked them to let his parents know where he was. He told them to inform his family that he was set on becoming a cowboy and not to expect him back for school, he commented. As he journeyed farther along the road, George encountered a group of horses and an old mule that had wandered off from the McJunkin ranch. Instead of walking, George opted to borrow a horse since Master McJunkin owed him for all the work he had done. Using his better judgment, he opted to ride the mule to avoid drawing attention. He fashioned a halter from his rope and rode along the road. Along the way, he stopped to assist in digging a well for a couple of white settlers constructing a sod house. The man compensated him with a handful of quarters, which George used to buy his first pair of boots upon reaching Comanche. He then secured a job as a horse wrangler for a camp situated outside of town. The cowboys were herding longhorns northward to Abilene, where they would be loaded onto rail cars bound for the east. Along the trail, George honed his horse handling skills by day, while the cowboys taught him to navigate by reading the stars at night. Upon arriving in Abilene, George used his earnings to buy new clothes and his very own horse. Instead of joining the other black cowboys traveling north, he decided to accept his boss's offer to continue working as a cowboy for him the next year, and returned south to Texas for the winter. While traveling near Comanche, George spotted a familiar old mule and promptly retrieved it, bringing it back to the McJunkin ranch. When he got back, George was offered a job by Gideon Roberts after impressing him with a remarkable bronc ride on a large gray mare. Roberts and three other men herded 700 horses across the Comanche-controlled staked plains of West Texas to New Mexico for sale on the Santa Fe Trail. Upon reaching Palo Duro Canyon in West Texas, they constructed a cabin and began gathering more horses for the herd. One day, while George was by himself in the canyon, he heard the thundering of hooves. It was a band of Comanche Indians rustling all the horses. George's saddle horse got loose in the chaos and galloped off with the stampeding Mustangs. The Indians approached George, realizing he was unarmed. One of them laughed and taunted, Black Mexican can walk now. They brandished their rifles, wheeled the horses around, and rode off with the stolen herd. When Roberts and the other men came back, they began the arduous job of rounding up the herd again. They encountered only one more Indian that winter. Roberts shot him and then he had George bury the Indian to prevent any retaliation from others. However, it appeared that the Indians sought revenge nonetheless. They discovered the lifeless body of Gideon's brother, who hadn't returned from a turkey hunt. He had been fatally beaten with a tomahawk. After the herd was restored to its original size following the Indian raid, they set off for New Mexico. Upon reaching the high-low country in northeastern New Mexico, George was captivated by the dry Samaran Valley also known as the Seco Samaran by the Mexican sheep herders. George ascended the slopes of Capulin Mountain, an extinct volcano that rose from the terrain like a massive ant hill, offering a commanding vista of the valley. The stunning sight of lush meadows dotted with wild irises, and the juniper-covered mesa below reminded him of the promised land described in the Bible. Apart from the Comanche, the valley was also home to Spanish sheep herders. Two of them, Carlitos Corne and Candido Archuleta, part of the initial cattlemen in the area with the Dutch outfit, grew to be George's best pals. George occupied his days by wandering the river and following the horses as they wandered the expansive open range. 
Along the Cimarron cutoff of the Santa Fe Trail, there were few travelers, as most stuck to the main route, and there was little demand for horses in the area. Following Charles Goodnight and the vast herd of Longhorns heading north to the mines and military outposts, Roberts directed George to herd the horses over Trinchera Pass into Colorado, established the inaugural horse ranch a few miles east of Trinidad. The ranch sat alongside the Purgatory River, near the mountain branch of the Santa Fe Trail. Robert quickly offloaded the horses once George had them trained, and before long, the horses from Roberts groomed by George became a valuable commodity. Trinidad back then was a rough and lawless town where Bat Masterson served as sheriff for a while. Even Billy the Kid rode into town once intent on killing four doctors, but fortunately, Sister Blandina Segal managed to talk him out of it. George would only stay in town long enough to get supplies before quickly returning to the ranch. During one of his supply runs, he purchased a fiddle. George enjoyed playing the fiddle at the old Trinchera Plaza at night for his friends when he wasn't receiving reading and writing lessons from Gideon Roberts' sons, Emmett and Coke. In exchange for his lessons, he would teach the boys how to break horses. As George's reputation grew, he was asked to help with the roundup at the 101, close to no man's land, which was the point along the dry Samaran River where Oklahoma and New Mexico territory intersected. Following the roundup, Ben Smith, the foreman of the 101, approached George and offered him a position working for Dr. Thomas Owen, who had previously served as mayor of Trinidad and was a partner in the 101. The doctor was establishing a new place called Hereford Park. Without hesitation, George accepted the offer, knowing that the doctor raised some of the finest horses in the region and that Hereford Park was situated at the headwaters of the Dry Cimarron, George's beloved promised land. Right away, George drove up from Texas to Hereford Park to help his brother John and the doctor bury the three sacks of gold that they had acquired from selling the cattle. The trio was concerned that the co-gang, based in no man's land, might have caught wind of the sale and would likely be searching for the gold. George volunteered to keep watch over it until the next spring when they planned to return to buy more cattle. As Dr. Owen was spending more time away from Hereford Park, George's responsibilities increased. He supervised the crew that constructed the large house and barn and taught the doctor's sons, Tom and Ben, how to ride Broncos, rewarding them with new spurs just like he did for the Roberts boys and many others he instructed over the years. One evening after supper, Dr. Owen informed George that this would be the final roundup before they enclosed the open range, and he appointed George as the wagon boss. George was hesitant as he would be responsible for 20 cowboys, 2,000 head of cattle, and 200 horses. However, Dr. Owen assured him that he was the finest cowboy in New Mexico, and there was no one better suited for the task. Eventually, he gained the respect of the other Texas cowboys who initially harbored resentment about working under a black man. During the autumn of 1889, George and 14 cowboys from the Cross L, Pitchfork, and 101 ranches found themselves trapped in a 10-day blizzard near Clayton. The blizzard was so intense that it decimated most of the 1,200 steers and the Pitchfork's entire 200, head Ramuda. Had it not been for George stepping up on the third day and guiding them to the Bramlett Ranch, the cowboys would have suffered a similar fate. Two years after the blizzard, Dr. Owen requested George to prepare the buggy and drive him into Folsom to catch the train. At that point, the doctor was elderly and ailing, and this journey marked their final ride together. George assisted him onto the train, and the doctor expressed his gratitude, saying, Thank you, thank you. I know you'll take good care of things. As the train departed, George's friend and mentor passed away before it reached Trinidad. George now faced a significant responsibility as a paternal figure for Tom and Ben, who were not yet mature enough to manage the ranch independently. George attracted the attention of their new neighbor, Bill Jack, a prominent cattleman in New Mexico, who owned the XYZ Ranch located a mile north of Hereford Park. It was on the Crowfoot Ranch where George found his next chance. George was dispatched by Mr. Jack to gather his herd and return it to the Crowfoot via train to Silver City. While riding into Silver City, George witnessed four men assaulting another man. Drawing his rifle, George remarked, It's an awfully hot day for that kind of work, isn't it? George's horse startled and bewildered the men, prompting them to turn around. Amidst the chaos, the assailants managed to escape. However, the man George had rescued turned out to be a lieutenant in the cavalry stationed at Fort Bayard. These men were attempting to rob him of the payroll. 
grateful for George's intervention, the lieutenant gave him his telescope as a token of appreciation. George intended to utilize it, along with the transit he obtained from his friend, the proprietor of the T.O. Ranch, to enclose the open range. This wasn't his only run-in with outlaws. While returning to the Crowfoot Ranch from Folsom, George came across a camp of unfamiliar men. Something about them made him uneasy. The next day, his suspicions were confirmed when news spread that a train had been robbed between Folsom and Des Moines, and the gang had made off with a hefty haul of gold and silver. George wasted no time alerting Sheriff George Titsworth, leading him to the spot where he had seen the suspicious camp. Together, they discovered shreds of a note scattered around the area. Titsworth gathered the torn pieces and took them back to the store in Folsom, now the Folsom Museum, where they painstakingly pieced the note back together. Based on the intel from the letter, Titsworth determined they were making their way to Simarin. He quickly assembled a posse, boarded the train, and intercepted the outlaws in Turkey Canyon near Simarin. A fierce gunfight erupted, resulting in the death of Sheriff Ed Farr and injuries to two outlaws, Sam Ketchum and Elza Lay. Ketchum succumbed to his wounds in the New Mexico State Penitentiary, while Lay was later captured near El Paso, Texas. This event signaled the downfall of both the Wild Bunch and the Ketchum Gang, notorious for their joint exploits. Soon after, Thomas Blackjack Ketchum, brother of Sam Ketchum, faced the gallows for his involvement in yet another train robbery. Meanwhile, Butch Cassidy and Sundance fled to Argentina, marking the end of an era for the notorious outlaw gangs. George's most notable accomplishment occurred in the wake of the most devastating event the Dry Simaran Valley had ever faced. On August 27, 1908, a thunderstorm unleashed 14 inches of rain on Johnson Mesa, just above the Crowfoot. The resulting flood ravaged the town of Folsom and carved deep into the valley. Following the deluge, George assessed the destruction. While riding along Wild Horse Arroyo, he spotted bones protruding from the bank nearly 11 feet below the surface. Recognizing that these bones were too large to belong to modern buffalo, he deduced they must be remnants of an extinct species. George extracted several bones and a skull, showcasing them to anyone willing to listen over the next 14 years, including his friend Carl Schwahiam. Despite his efforts, George failed to convince anyone of significance to investigate the site further. He passed away in January 1922 at the Folsom Hotel. Four years later, Schwahim guided the Colorado Museum of Natural History to the location George had uncovered. In 1926, the museum conducted excavations at the site to retrieve ancient bison artifacts for exhibition, leading to a remarkable discovery. During the excavation, archaeologists unearthed a stone projectile point embedded in the ribs of one of the extinct bison. These bison had vanished during the last ice age. The uncovering of a man-made point associated with an 8,000-year-old skeleton turned out to be the most significant archaeological find of the 20th century, providing evidence that humans had inhabited the North American continent millennia earlier than previously believed by scholars. His fame stemmed from this discovery, but it's his bravery, resolve, and persistence that define his legacy, a genuine cowboy through and through. Almost a century after his passing, George McJunkin was honored alongside other iconic figures at the Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, in April 2019.